Hey, I'm Pastor Rod. Thanks for joining us today. I hope this message makes a difference for you. The last three weeks, we've been talking about forgiveness, specifically how to forgive people who've wronged you. It's a huge issue. Reading your emails and Facebook messages, I'm excited how many of you have found freedom from unforgiveness. If you missed any of the weeks, I encourage you, go back, listen online or on the app. Today, we're going to look at the other side of the issue. What do you do? What do you need to know and what do you need to do when you're the one who requires forgiveness, when you're the offender? It's not just Christians who ask that question. Hundreds of songs have been written asking the question, will you forgive me or how can I be forgiven? You know, when it comes to forgiveness, some people are clueless. They blow through life offending people with their words and actions. They leave a horrible trail of wrong and offended people and never even know it. They've refined rude insensitivity to an art form. But really, those people are a rare exception. I can't help them. They won't change until they crash. I'm not talking to the clueless who don't know they need forgiveness. Instead, I'm talking to you. If you know you've messed up and you desperately want to be forgiven, but you're just not quite sure how to go about it. When you know you've hurt or offended someone, if you're like me, you've, you've just got a horrible pit in your stomach. Keeps me awake at night. I want to do whatever I can as soon as I can to resolve the situation. Maybe you violated your marriage vows with an improper relationship or an affair. You said something in the heat of an argument you didn't mean. You know words hurt, and you also know you can't take them back. You made a promise to someone, and you didn't keep it. You cheated a business partner, or you ripped someone off. Maybe you lost your temper. Your angry rant or even physical violence cost you relationship and respect. Maybe your gossip has damaged people. You Maybe you even spoke out against a, a spiritual leader and caused division in a church. You have a long-running dispute with a family member. They've done wrong, but you've done your share as well. Maybe you said what you said wasn't an argument. You were trying to be funny, and you made a joke at someone else's expense that turned out not to be so funny. It hurt. Perhaps it's even deeper. Maybe you weren't a good parent, and your parenting left emotional scars on your children. I could go on forever if your hurt caused someone else an offense or pain, what do you do? Where do you start? I can't cover every imaginable situation. There's no way to provide you with a foolproof, cover every conflict script. However, I want to share principles that will help you resolve conflict and find forgiveness. I am of the belief that conflict should be resolved. And I believe all conflict can be resolved. Now, is all conflict resolved? No. Not in the world, not in the body of Christ. But all conflict could be resolved if people followed scriptural principles. Conflict being resolved doesn't mean you're best friends. Doesn't mean you get remarried, still work together, or call every week. Conflict resolved means it's not boiling in your spirit. You're able to look and think of that person without bitterness, anger, or hate. You can move beyond the hurt and the feelings. Now, as a framework for today's discussion, I want to read three verses from Colossians chapter 3, starting with verse 12. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourself or put on compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body, that's the body of Christ, you are called to peace and be thankful. In the body of Christ, unresolved conflict grieves the heart of God and discredits your testimony. All conflict in the body of Christ should be resolved. At the very least, we can agree to disagree within the bonds of unity and love. Conflict being resolved 
doesn't start with the other person. It starts with you. You have to do your part. I have a friend who had an improper relationship with a woman who wasn't his wife. He's a wonderful man of God. I love and respect. He's gone through a process of restoration and is a better husband and a better representation of Jesus than ever before. And as I talk, you'll hear some of his words because I had him give me some input. And you'll be able to tell because he talks a little different than me. And I think you'll also sense some of what he learned through his experience and his crisis. I apologize that your outline's like a book today, uh, but I wanted you to have it all. This is a big issue. There are a lot of lessons to learn, so let's start through them. When you need forgiveness, don't avoid the person you've offended. That's your natural inclination. When you know someone is hurt or offended, you just want to stay away. You don't want the confrontation, so you avoid. The problem is that only makes the hurt worse. Don't wait for them to apologize. If you wait for their apology, you may wait forever. Take the first step. Initiate contact. Second, be honest with yourself about what you did and the depth of hurt you caused. Until you're honest with the seriousness of your mistake, you will never move towards wholeness. You've got to get at the point where you can say, I did this and it caused this. Here's the principle. You'll never be honest with others if you can't first be honest with yourself. This is the, often the point of the restoration process where people drop out. They don't want to admit their problem, their sin. They want you to forget it, and they want to forget it. Their strategy is to ignore it and just hope it goes away, or even worse, to cover it up. And they're often surrounded by enablers who tell them that's the best option. Not true. Being completely and totally honest with yourself is the first step towards being healthy and whole. As you seek forgiveness, don't be pessimistic. Be optimistic. Believe for restored relationship. Believe for healing. Believe for forgiveness. Hope for the best. Believe that something good's going to happen. Paul wrote, love bears up under anything and everything that comes. Is ever ready to believe the best of every person. Its hopes are fadeless under all circumstances. It endures everything without weakening. I, I had somebody say, really? You're going to give them the benefit of the doubt? That's, that's what love does. It believes the best of others. If you want forgiveness, confess. Don't wait for the person you've hurt to come to you in confrontation. When you know you've done wrong, go to the person and confess. Go as soon as you can. And if all possible, this should be done in person, face to face. You want them to not only see your words, but you want them to hear your heart. And seeing their reaction helps you know if you're doing an effective job of apologizing. If you can't go in person, talk on the phone. If you can't talk on the phone, write an email. But whenever possible, attempt to talk face to face. When you confess, it gives credibility to your remorse. When you confess, it helps the victim to believe that you're sorry for what you did, not sorry you got caught. Lots of people confess after they get caught or when the consequences get bad. Confess, say these three words, I was wrong. My friend did exactly that. He didn't get caught. His affair was in secret, but he knew if he was ever going to be free, he had to confess. It was tough. It was ugly. It was painful. It was messy, but it was right. If you want forgiveness, apologize. Seems simple, but apologize. Now, I taught my boys growing up, and I've taught you in the past. I want to teach you again. There are three components to an effective apology. Number one, I'm sorry. It's my fault. Never should have happened. Number two, I was wrong. No excuses. I was wrong. Number three, what can I do to make it right? And then prepare to do whatever they ask. If you miss one of those three components, then your apology isn't effective. My friend wrote, in your apology, communicate your sorrow openly to the person you've wounded. Don't expect them to just assume you're sorrowful about what you did. 
tell them how sorry you are. If you aren't visibly sorrowful and broken, they will doubt you've truly come to grips with how deep you've hurt them. When you understand how you've hurt someone else, it should result in brokenness. A deep sorrow for your own wrongs. Caution, don't put on a show of emotion. The other person can sense if you're sincere. Remember, they already don't trust you. If you attempt to mislead them regarding your emotional response to your mistake, you'll only set the relationship back even further. Now, let me quickly give you some apology principles. Now we're in the subheading under the subheading in the outline. (laughs) Well, you apologize. Don't bring up what they did wrong. Remember, this is an apology, not an accusation. If they want to apologize for their part of the conflict, that's their business. Your task is to make your wrong right, not their wrong right. Don't go all over, the, over all the details. If you are apologizing, don't relive the moment. Don't do it. If you go back over the details, all you do is open the wound. If they press for details, just say, that's not my goal. My goal is to admit I was wrong and make it right. One of the worst things that happens is when someone comes to you and apologizes for an offense you never knew about. Instead of saying, Rod, I'm sorry my attitude towards you is crummy, I apologize, they start in with a list of all the things they said. And usually find a way to include all the horrible things I did to make them mad. And when they're all done with that, they apologize. Now, they may feel better, but I feel worse. Listen to me. Some things you just need to make right with God. If the other person doesn't have any idea you spoke against them or offended them, instead of apologizing to them, why don't you go make it right with the people you said it to? Fix it with them and with God. When you're apologizing, don't argue. It's an apology, not an argument. If the other person tries to draw you into argument, they're evidencing their lack of forgiveness. Don't let their lack of forgiveness co-opt you into continuing the conflict. Don't expect the other person to respond with an apology and then get mad if they don't. This is classic in a marriage argument. Honey, I'm sorry. I didn't mean any of that. Please forgive me. And she responds, I do. I love you. And there's just silence. And you say, well, aren't you going to say anything? Well, I did. I said, I love you and forgive you. Yeah, well, thanks for that. But weren't you going to apologize? Well, what for? You were wrong. (laughs) And the argument over the apology becomes bigger than the original offense, right? I heard someone and offended someone I care about. I offered a genuine, heartfelt apology that was accepted. Then on my drive home, I started thinking, now, wait a minute. Am I the only one wrong here? Why in the world didn't he apologize? How dare he just sit there, accept my apology, and act like the fault is all mine? I was angry because he didn't respond to my apology with his apology, and I forgot a basic principle. I'm responsible for me. I'm going to do the right thing, whether you do the right thing or not. You're responsible for you. I'm not. Have you ever heard someone apologize like this? Well, I'm sorry if I offended you. Or if I did something wrong, I'm sorry. Or I'm sorry if I made you mad. An apology that uses the word if isn't an apology. When you use the word if in apology, you are being condescending. You're saying this is really your issue, but I'm apologizing to prove that I'm the bigger person. Don't do it. When you apologize, don't rationalize, excuse, or explain your action. Just apologize. An excuse is an attempt to say, well, I did it, but it wasn't really my fault. We have normed those kind of excuses in our culture. Let me show you what I mean. We even make t-shirts with excuses. And I, I'm going to show you, we're going to do a little t-shirt fashion show here. Here you go. Come on up here, Nick. Here's the one. (laughs) 
sorry I'm late. I have kids. <laughs> Let me show you this one. I, now, I've actually used this one just the other day. Anthony's got it on. The devil made me do it. How about this one that Byron's wearing? Very, very typical now. Sorry, not sorry. Now, Becca is, is very appropriate for her. She's my assistant, and she's a whiner when it's cold. I'm sorry for what I said when it was winter. Because if it's cold, that absolves you of all excuses. Alan's, you can actually buy the shirt. I'm sorry if I offended you with my common sense. How much do we need that in politics right now? <laughs> Hayden, it's very appropriate that Hayden's wearing this one. I'm sorry for what I said when you tried to wake me up. Because if I'm grouchy and sleepy, it doesn't matter. Miranda's, now she, Miranda's just the sweetest person you'll ever meet. So I don't know why she picked this shirt. It must be what's in her heart. I'm sorry I slapped you, but you didn't seem like you'd ever stop talking, and I panicked. <laughs> Thank you, my t-shirt models. <laughs> All excuses you've heard. Here's the principle. Excuses invalidate apologies. Don't bother apologizing if you're going to follow it up with an excuse. Because people will remember your feeble excuse and forget your apology. They don't care why you did it. They care that you did it. And all too often, apologies are a defense, not an apology. Don't fall into that trap. Just apologize. When you apologize, instead of offering excuses, dig deep for reasons. A reason is the action or the condition of your heart that allowed you to get to the point where you made that mistake. My friend had an impo improper relationship with a woman who wasn't his wife. Excuses would be, well, I deserve better. My wife didn't treat me right. After all, I have my needs. I just wasn't happy, and everyone deserves to be happy which, by the way, is not in the Bible. Instead of sorry excuses, he looked for reasons. He said, my relationship with God wasn't where it should be. I was filled with pride. I had unrealistic expectations of others. Make excuses, and you'll make the mistake again. Discover reasons and you can grow beyond the mistake. Your goal when you sin against a person should be to do all the introspection and spiritual surgery necessary in order to identify what in you allowed you to commit that wrong. People don't do this because it hurts. It's painful to admit to yourself what you've done and to confront the reasons you did it. When you apologize... Don't put your focus on how the other person responds to your apology. The focus should not be on whether they accept your apology, trust you again, or even want reconciliation. Instead, the focus should be on the posture of your heart and the process God is taking you through in order to get you where he wants you. If you focus on their response, it takes the weight off you and you need to feel the heaviness. It is healthy to feel the weight of the hurt you caused. It helps remind you how difficult and profoundly hurtful your mistake was. Don't ever forget the, the look on the victim's face when they learned of your mistake. And let that push you towards change. When you need forgiveness, be willing to take bold steps to regain trust. Trust is different than forgiveness. You can be forgiven, but your sin or your mistake 
cause someone you love to do someone you love to lose trust in you. Do whatever it takes to regain trust. Change your phone number. Cancel your email or your Facebook account. Call and report your whereabouts every 20 minutes. Go overboard in commuting, communicating what your next move is and why you're making it. See, if you buck against whatever they ask you to do in order to regain their trust, it reveals that you're not committed to the process. Now, let me give you a warning. You will think you should be trusted again long before they're ready to trust you. I see this happen almost every time, especially in marriage. The offending spouse thinks it's been long enough. She should trust me now. He should be over it. Here's the deal. If you're the offending party, it's not up to you to decide when trust has been reestablished. It's up to the person who's been offended. Understand, forgiveness is both an event and a process. When they make the decision to forgive you, that's the decision to enter into the process. The sting of what you did may still be there, but they value the relationship and God's desire for their life greater than they want to hold on to the offense, so they decide to move forward. That doesn't mean it will never come up again. Understand, the part of forgiving you is they try to make sense of how it could happen. Instead of avoiding those conversations or resenting the fact that they bring it up, be open and honest about the things you're learning. They'll probably have to both passively and actively forgive you. It's healthy for them to say, I forgive you again. Whenever they're reminded of the sting of your mistake, don't resent that, embrace that. When you apologize, include everyone you can in the restoration, the forgiveness, and the reunion. See, we have a tendency, we draw people into our conflicts, we don't draw people into our resolutions. When you're mad, You tell others, and you try to get people on your side. You want someone to justify your anger. Then you don't tell them when it's fixed. And as a result, people carry your offense that's long gone for you. You see this all the time in churches. Me and Brittany have a problem. We both tell our friends. We tell anyone else who will listen all about the problem. By the way, that's called gossip, and it's sin. Then two weeks later, Brittany and I patch it up but we don't tell everyone else. We can't tell everyone else because we don't know how far the story's gone. Now people are mad at me for something I did to Brittany that she's not mad about. People are mad at Brittany for something she said about me that I've already forgotten. Here's a great principle. Don't involve other people in your offense. Involve people in your reconciliation. Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, if you forgive anyone, I also forgive him. And what I've forgiven, if there's anything to forgive, I've forgiven in the sight of Christ for your sake in order that Satan may not outwit us. We are not unaware of his schemes. Satan uses conflict and unforgiveness to divide the body of Christ. Be wise to his strategy and include everyone in the reconciliation. Very important. Don't allow reconciliation with the other person to overshadow your reconciliation with God. The bottom line is you sin. Your number one priority is to let God restore your heart to where you're sensitive to his voice and where you'll listen when he helps you avoid repeating that mistake. You desperately want the conflict to be over. Remember, sin also puts you in conflict with God. Don't forget to fix that relationship as well. And for just a moment, let me go back to the words of Jesus who teaches the same principle in the New Testament. Therefore, if you're offering your gift at the altar and remember your brother has something against you, leave your gift in front of the altar. First, go be reconciled to your brother. Then come back and offer your gift. Jesus says reconciliation is so important, you should even leave church to make it right. How big a deal is this? One more time, we've got to go to it. Jesus said, if you forgive men when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their sins, your Father won't forgive your sins. There's a lot writing on this. 
It's time to find forgiveness. It's time to let it go. Now, this is heavy. I get that, and I know that. I want to finish by encouraging you with this principle. When people find restoration in a human relationship, it almost always results in spiritual growth and inner peace. For some of you, your spiritual growth, the reason it's been stalled, is unresolved relational conflict. Make it right. And as you do, you can expect God's peace and God's blessings. Here's the cool things. There is no expiration date for an apology. It's never too late to say, I'm sorry. And when you apologize right, the results are beautiful. Conflict is resolved and unity is restored. It can be difficult, I know. Even thinking about going and apologizing is challenging to you. It's worth it. You say, well, they're angry at me and I didn't do anything wrong. You know what I've learned? I can just say, I'm sorry I hurt you. If I hurt you, why wouldn't I say that? Even if I don't agree that you should be hurt, even if I don't think I did it, if you're hurt, I'm sorry I hurt you. That was never my intention. That was never, that was never my heart. I love you. Take this step, make it right. You start, it's worth it. Would you bow your heads with me? And I want to pray for you. You say, Pastor Odd, uh, there's conflict and I've been waiting on the other person. I've been putting the pressure on them. And I know even while you're talking, I got to start. I got to do this. I got to make it right. Maybe you've apologized in the past and did it wrong. You know what you get to do? You get to go back and this time apologize the right way. 